Hi everyone, second part of the future of work following the first, second and maybe third unbundling. So if you remember what we went over last week, we talked about the different industrial revolutions and the impact they had on the labor market at their respective times. We saw that in particular, um, the first industrial revolution, which was um, pretty much the steam revolution, the mechanical revolution, and the third industrial revolution had an impact on skilled workers. The first industrial revolution had an impact on skill, on the demand for skilled artisans. Uh, the demand for skilled artisans was lower because production was uh, uniformized, uh, uniform, yeah, uniformized um, to benefit from internal economies of scale. And that was at the opposite of what skilled artisans do. They spend more time producing a good, which is going to be, um, which is going to be maybe a higher quality good, but it's going to take more time and it's going to cost more than a good that can be produced on a conveyor belt. For the third industrial revolution, that was the advent of computers, internet, and communication overall. Semi-skilled workers um, had a decrease in demand because their work uh, was a substitute for computers and computers could complement the work of skilled workers. We went over different views, so pessimistic views about the fact that now people have to compete with machines pretty much. The usual Karl Marx, um, Karl Marx uh, criticism of, of capitalism pretty much. The optimistic view, however, is that machines or um, technology in general, innovations, can make work easier or they can free people from labor. Then we went over the, uh, the consequence of the fourth industrial revolution on, um, on the structure of jobs. We went over the fact that there is a uh, destructive effect after an industrial revolution. So some jobs are not in high demand anymore because they can be replaced by some of the innovations. But there is also a demand effect that unfortunately takes more time to appear where more jobs are created in a different sector because new needs arise. So there is pretty much a um, shift in the structure of employment that can be by sector or that can be by skill level. And as an example, I went into ATMs and bank employment. In fact, both have increased. So the, uh, the number of ATMs and the um, employment in the banking sector have increased after uh, the third industrial revolution. So it made it possible the creation of ATMs able to do simple or routine bank tellers tasks. So you can deposit checks, payment transfers. You can look at your balance uh, if this is an ATM from your bank. And uh, there are many things that a bank teller would do before. And now you don't need to wait at um, inside, the, um, inside the branch to meet a teller. So the number of bank tellers plummeted. So now if you go to a bank, you will find two, maybe three tellers. Whereas back in the 80s and the 90s, you could have four or five and there would be lineups because people needed to find a bank teller to, uh, they needed to meet a bank teller to get anything done. What the banks did, however, is they could create more branches. The competition among banks moved from fund handling type services to personal and investment type services. There was an increase in the number of branches. So more ATMs were produced because maybe you need two, three, four ATMs per bank. If you make a new branch, you're going to need some ATMs. At the same time, you're going to need some bank tellers as well. So the result of this has been twofold. More branches, more bank employees, more ATMs. That was the demand effect. Now that bank tellers are not so needed anymore, the demand effect led to the creation of those um, higher skilled positions, 
like um, um, financial advisors and other things like that. So with the increase of those jobs, you can probably assume, can probably guess that there was an increase in the number of CFAs that were, um, that were delivered to, um, to students and, and employees. So there was an increase in higher skilled bank employees. They are more productive also because they work with computers. So that's also part of the third industrial revolution, which complement their tasks. So the banking industry is a good illustration of what happened during or after the third industrial revolution. Some jobs get obsolete and they're replaced by machines. This is the case of tellers. And uh, if you want to be a teller now, you, you will probably be asked to have a a very limited amount of educational background. Probably with a high school degree or maybe one year college, you can be a bank teller. Jobs get created, which is more on the investment and financial advisor side. These jobs are higher skilled than the obsolete jobs, mostly because computers act as a complement input for these workers. Being able to use computers now, if you see your financial advisor, I did see my financial advisor in February, I think, and she asked me about how I wanted to deal with my uh, TFSA mutual funds, whatever, whatever it is. I don't know much about this. And she made me fill a questionnaire of how much risk I am willing to take, how much return I want to see in the medium run, short run and long run, and so on. And after that, the software spat out a, a certain fund that uh, my money should be invested in. It's a fund that has a certain amount of volatility, so subject to a certain amount of risk, and has a certain average return um, that has been observed over time. Well, some of these workers might not know exactly, or probably most of them don't know, the formula behind this questionnaire. In fact, I asked her, what does that mean? What does that mean? And she just pretty much read what was on the computer. I was like, Thank you, but I know I can read the computer. So she was telling me, oh, you can go for the option um, high risk, uh, high reward. And then she would just literally read the numbers for me. I'm like, yeah, I, I can read that. But what does a risk mean? Because I have an idea of what it is. I've done some finance, but I wanted to ask her, what is this black box? What is this questionnaire? What is behind? What is the formula that is being used? You know, and she couldn't tell me much about the risk, what the risk means. Risk is pretty much the standard deviation or the, vari the variance of the returns over time. Um, you can adjust this with uh, different, uh, different uh, measures, but overall, that's pretty much what it is. And pretty much since she was my advisor, I asked her to break the black box and she was like, oh, yeah, that, that's complicated. It's like, yeah, that's complicated. Probably she doesn't know it either. That's... So I was like, how can I trust an advisor that knows as much as I do? In this case, I can just be at home and, and do my own stuff on Quest Trade or something. Um, so that was pretty disappointing, but that's, I guess not every financial advisor is like that. Um, but computers can act as a complement in the sense that they can do compute all of those formulas for you. And they can also be a substitute for your knowledge. Something that is a huge generational gap is the fact that nowadays, more and more, but definitely now, we don't need to understand how things work. We just need to know how to make them work. Some of you might know computer science, might understand the idea behind a language, a compiler, and all those things. But most of you probably have no idea about what's going on in the background of the apps you're using every day. Back in the days, it was pretty much the same where when a TV showed up, people did not need to know exactly how TVs worked. They knew that there was some kind of a signal that was received, but they could not know exactly like they didn't need to know exactly how the signal was captured by the TV, uh, why it was be jammed, it would be jammed in some areas and not others and so on. More and more, we don't need to know how things work. We just need to know how to make them work. Okay. So that was maybe one of the reasons um, she, my financial advisor, did not know 
um, how to, did not know what was in the black box in this magic formula, pretty much. And there is a lot of that, especially even when people talk about machine learning. They're the ones who know what exactly is going on, and they're the ones who are going to scratch the surface. They're going to explain to you a very uh, broad idea about mach what machine learning is, and I can even explain you that, whereas I pretty much learned this as a hobby. But what I still don't know is actually what's going on in the code. I can code in different, with different softwares and languages, but I still don't know exactly how those algorithms are being coded because most of the knowledge I find online is very broad. It's like, oh yeah, you have a network of, of neurons that are connected to each other and give feedback and, and, and feed each other. Yeah, I get that. How do you put that in a computer is what I need to know. So, sorry, I got carried away. <laughs> so let's talk about the net employment effects. A technological change leads to a more efficient use of labor. A machine, steam engine, assembly line, computer, makes each unit of labor more efficient. So it increases the productivity of a worker. So any worker whose productivity has been increased thanks to this additional capital, those machines, is going to be in higher demand and maybe is going to, ha is going to see his wage increase because now he's more productive. So capital on its own could be productive if the machine is working autonomously. A worker could be productive if he can work autonomously without a machine. But at the end of the day, what matters is the interaction between the different inputs. So there are two things. For the same level of production, you don't need as many workers anymore because each worker is more productive than it used to be. So before, with 10 computers and uh, 10 workers, you had a certain productivity. But after doing an update on the computers, maybe, like a new software, a new Windows update, you only need maybe uh, eight workers to do the same job as 10 workers, because maybe those two extra computers can be uh, manipulated through some kind of a network. So you don't need as much labor to produce the same amount uh, as before. So machines and labor tend to be substitutes, but not perfect substitutes. Perfect substitutes means you can literally fire someone and replace him with a computer and the computer will work on its own. So all the ones, all the workers who still keep their job are more productive. All the ones uh, who lose their job are going to be worse off because they are replaced. And so here you can see that there is some kind of a duality. Insiders, the ones who keep their jobs, are better off. They have higher wages because they're more productive. The ones who were laid off because they were not needed anymore are going to be worse off. And it is the same idea with um, a minimum wage. If you impose a minimum wage or if you increase the minimum wage in a given area, there's going to be two effects. The insiders, the ones who are going to keep their jobs, are going to be happier because the minimum wage has increased. But because there is an increase in the minimum wage, there is an increase in the cost of hiring a worker. So firms' demand for labor will decrease. So they might decide to hire less people or they might decide to lay some people off because they say, hey, now I need to pay all those people you're the most junior one. I'm going to keep the seniors who already know what they're doing and everything. Sorry about that, but I need to cover my costs. I cannot afford to hire, uh, to employ you anymore. And so the outsiders are worse off because they're going to have a harder time to find a job now because they cost more to a firm. So the question is, under which circumstance will there be a net increase in the demand for labor in an, in an industry as a result of a technological change? To answer this question, we're going to get into the concept of elasticity. If the demand for the product is elastic, then 
there will be a higher demand for workers. Let's look at the logic and I will define the elasticity in the next slide. The introduction of a technology is made when it, it, dec it decreases the cost of production. So a firm is going to buy a machine or update a software or you know, make an expense if it thinks that it will lead to a lower production cost. Otherwise, it's not worth it. So investments can be big. So you have to be sure of yourself. You have to make sure that it's going to help you be more productive or decrease your cost of production. If there is enough competition in the industry, the price of the good will decrease. As a result of competition, you are going to, as a firm, you're going to compete with other firms. If it costs you less to produce the good, you will want, you will have incentives to decrease the price, the, the, the sale price to be more competitive. Now, if the price decreases, there will be more demand for the product. The good is cheaper, same quality as before. People are going to buy more of it. So there's going to be a higher production. And so there will be a higher demand for labor. Now, if a firm decreases its price, it will make a lower profit on each unit, but people will buy more units. So it's not clear if the firm is really going to increase its profits by decreasing the price. It all depends if the, in the resulting increase in the quantity produced will be high enough. And this is where the concept of elasticity comes in. The elasticity of demand is the percentage change in the quantity demanded for a product for each percentage increase in the price of this product. So the elasticity of demand or the price elasticity of demand is by how much the quantity consumed by people, by consumers will increase or decrease as a result of 1% increase in the price of the product. In general, you can expect that if the price of a good increases, the demand for the good will decrease. And I say in general because there can be some very special cases, very special goods that I won't talk about um, today. So let's take an example to put things in perspective. Suppose the demand elasticity of a product is high. It's equal to minus five. Minus five means minus 5%. This means that a 1% price reduction leads to a 5% increase in the volume sold. Or equivalently, a 1% increase in the price leads to a 5% decrease in the volume sold. So in this case, if the firm decreases the price by just a bit, 1%, then it will increase quantity so much that the firm will still be able to increase its profits. The total revenue of the firms or industry selling this product must rise and more labor will be hired to satisfy this higher demand. So in this case, the firm will want to, to decrease the price by 1% to get a 5% uh, increase in the volume sold and to produce that extra volume, firms will need to hire. So here the elasticity is considered to be high because it is 5%, which is way bigger than 1%. Now imagine the elasticity is actually low. So rather than minus five, it's going to be minus 0.5. So minus 0.5%. So 1% price reduction leads to 0.5% increase in the volume demanded. So the total revenue of the firms or industry must fall 
which will result in a lower overall demand for labor in the industry. So if competition forces you to decrease prices, you're going to decrease your prices. But in this case, the quantity consumed will not uh, will increase, but will not increase enough for firms or for an industry to have incentives to hire more. Finally, if the elasticity is unitary, so if the elasticity is equal to minus one, if you increase the price by 1%, you decrease the quantity consumed by 1% and vice versa. So the price effect and the volume effect will cancel each other. There will be no change in the labor employed in this industry. So those are rough lines, okay? There are more uh, more things to that get into the um, innovations or technical um, technical technological advances. It can also structure costs differently. It could overall decrease costs, like divide costs by two, sure, or it could change the way the costs are being structured. So. Things can be a bit more complicated, but overall, the elasticity of demand is going to give us an idea of what firms or what industry will um, hire more as a result of an innovation. So let's go over a couple of markets with inelastic demands versus elastic demands. So inelastic demand means that if you increase the price by 1%, the quantity consumed does not decrease a lot or does not decrease, decrease at all. Okay, so inelastic means little change. People keep consuming the same quantity pretty much. An example is household lighting. The price of household lighting has decreased over a thousand fold since electricity but the household consumption has not increased to the same extent, nor the labor employed to produce lighting products. So it seems that lighting is, has a pretty inelastic demand in the sense that if there are changes in the price of, it, of electricity, people are not changing their consumption of electricity a lot. This is probably related to the idea that people have a steady amount of electricity they use a steady amount of electricity and electricity is not something they are, they wish was cheaper to just increase uh, their consumption of. Okay, so whether it's expensive or not, they need a minimum amount of electricity for lighting, for cooking, um, for heating, for um, electronic devices and so on. Gasoline. Gasoline has a pretty uh, inelastic demand, at least in the short run. So if there is an increase in the price of um, the, bar the, um, the barrel of gasoline next week, everywhere in Canada, the demand for gasoline will not decrease a lot, even if the increase is high. Because in the short run, people need their car. If they need the car to commute, go to work and whatnot, then definitely in the short run, they'll just have to suck it up. They'll just have to pay the higher price. They will complain about it. In the long run, however, if this increase is permanent, then in the long run, consumers will start considering other, um, other transportation devices. They'll be like, okay, maybe now I can go to work by bus and I'm gonna get a compass card. Or maybe I'm gonna change my vehicle. So in the long run or medium run, they might save to buy a vehicle that consumes less gasoline, or maybe that rolls on electricity, gas, or and so on. In the short run, changing your car can be difficult. It's a pretty expensive good. So um, demand will be relatively inelastic in the short run. Products from established industries have fairly inelastic demands. This is due to um, a, a reputation effect in general. 
brands which are known are used as a reference. When people go to the store and want to buy a candy bar, you have, of course, a couple of adventurous people who are going to go for the candy bar they've never seen before. They're going to, oh, I've never seen this one. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to try it. But a lot of people like to go for the comfort one, the comfort food. So they're going to go for the Ho Henry, the Coffee Crisp, the Snickers, the Mars, and so on. I just do this example because I love candy bars. But um, it is the same for clothing brands. If there is a new brand that you've never heard of, you might be more reluctant to spend money on it as opposed to spending that money on a brand that you already know, that you already trust, and that you will probably prefer um, to buy, to buy from. So not many people are pioneers consumers. They are the ones which are general are a bit uh, nerdy or geeky in their own um, in their own area. So people who really like um, clothing, they will definitely try different brands every time. And they're the ones who are going to blog about it or make a TikTok post or an Instagram post about it. Oh, guys, I went to the store today and I found this new brand. The quality of the fabric is great and the price is actually pretty good. So you should buy it. Sometimes it's sponsored, sometimes it's not. Others are just going for the reference brand. Sin goods, alcohol, tobacco, sugar, caffeine. So most addictive goods are called sin goods. Sin goods in general have a pretty inelastic demand due to their addictive nature. Tobacco, at least in France and Europe, has a pretty inelastic demand. When price increases, then, um, well, tobacco smokers still consume pretty much the same amount. They will definitely try to reduce, but if they don't have the willpower, a week later they are back to their usual consumption. Sugar, caffeine as well. Um, one of the reasons maybe why the demand for sugar and caffeine could be relatively inelastic is also because uh, sugar and caffeine are pretty cheap. If you want to buy a coffee, you can find a coffee for less than $2 at Tim Hortons, for instance. So if the price goes from $2 to $2.20, it's, um, it's not a big increase uh, in the price, but it's still a 1% um, increase in the price. However, if a pack of tobacco is already $12 and you increase this by uh, 1%, then uh, that will be more um, substantial. And one of the reasons why there is excise taxes on um, alcohol, tobacco, and so on is because those goods are sin goods. In Canada, you can check online, there is the tax on each pack of cigarettes, the excise tax, is equal to, I believe, $7. So when you buy a cigarette of 12, for $12, $7 are going to the government's pocket. There is also a price on uh, excise tax, sorry, on alcohol. So you can just check that on the Canadian government website. But those taxes are being criticized by other people because they are very uh, paternalistic. They are like nanny, uh, nanny taxes. They are taxes that are imposed to make you not consume stuff that is bad for your health. So it's pretty much like your parents forbidding you from buying something when you're a kid or they don't want to buy you something because it would be bad for you. And so some people are not really pro um, paternalism. Markets with elastic demands or markets, uh, markets with new products and services in general. When something is new, you might not feel the need to acquire it yet. So some pioneers that really like maybe some gadgets in their respective field might actually say, oh, what is this new thing? That might be useful and I might go for it. Others might stick to what they already um, use. And once they're established, the elasticity tends to decrease. One thing I want to add about um, tobacco, recently the elasticity of demand for tobacco products has decreased, uh, sorry, has increased, the elasticity has increased due 
to the appearance of substitutes for tobacco. Now you can, well, you can smoke cigarettes, roll your own cigarettes like a cowboy, or you can also like vape and use other devices to get your, um, to get your load of nicotine. So because they are substitutes, if the price of tobacco products gets too high, then people are going to try to switch to other products that provide them the nicotine they need. So the presence of substitutes is a, um, is a way to, is a signal that the elasticity for a product is likely to be high. For sugar, if there was a substitute for sugar, they are substitute for sugar, but if there was maybe better substitutes, maybe in terms of taste, that would convince other people to switch from getting a regular sugar in their coffee and switch to um, stevia, aspartame, and so on. A question in the chat is about whether the revenue from those uh, syntaxes is being used towards, well, the healthcare of, uh, where health uh, like is, is um, sorry, goes toward taking care of public health issues related to the sin, not in particular. So um, I don't know exactly how the money is being used. That's something you can check on the government website. Every year they post how they use the budget, but it's just another form of tax. So it's not that every tax on alcohol is used maybe to fund some um, alcohol related um, programs like maybe the um, AA and so on. It's more that it's going to go in the pool of tax revenue. Then you have a tax revenue for the whole year and you are going to figure out how to spend those taxes for uh, the next year. So I don't know how much is being used to treat those issues. But in general, the tax revenue is not directly used for that. Another question, which is more personal. Do I see vape products going to replace um, cigarettes in the near future? No, not fully replaced, not fully. I have a friend, for instance, who is uh, struggling with quitting tobacco. He loves tobacco and um, he tries to vape. He tried all the different things, but he likes the taste of tobacco. He likes smoking tobacco from a cigarette. And I believe that there will always be a core of people who enjoy that. Now, of course, as those people die, the younger people might not, uh, might not be as interested in tobacco and might maybe go for other substitutes like vaping or I don't know, they might get, they might smoke weed and so on. So, maybe tobacco eventually will disappear or maybe the tobacco industry will have to find a way to, um, to make the products more healthy. There's also a core of people who smoke weed that like to smoke spliffs. So a spliff, should I say that on camera? Okay, whatever, it's legal. <laughs> a spliff is a joint made with some tobacco and some weed. And you can just uh, choose the amount of tobacco you put in the joint. Other people like to smoke weed straight, so they smoke full joint or they have a pipe or they vape uh, weed or they use bongs or uh, edibles or what are the other ones? I don't know. There are many ways to uh, to get your weed. Um, <clears throat> some people like to put a bit of tobacco because one, it limits the amount of weed you're smoking, so it doesn't make you as high. And two, there's actually a nice taste. Personally, I like spliffs, but I hate tobacco. I don't like to smoke tobacco unless I'm very drunk. For some reason, when I'm drunk, tobacco goes, uh, goes in smoothly. Uh, terrible hangover though, because of the tobacco, honestly. Uh, but I love spliffs. So every now and then, I don't mind having a bit of tobacco in a joint of weed. Um, I like the taste, doesn't make me as high. So it's a win-win for me. Other question, then I'll move on. Why is smoking so popular in France? I don't know, smoking was related to style a long time ago. A long time ago, people who were smoking were stylish, it was classy, you know? Um, women who had their dress and their hat and they had these long, thin cigarettes. I think it was a mark of 
maybe it was, I don't know if it was a mark of um, the bourgeoisie or if it was a mark of being classy, but definitely in France, and I agree, smoking looks cool. <laughs> so I don't know if that, that makes people start smoking, but um, yeah. Well, there's, there was also a lot of advertising back then towards smoking, even in the US. Smoking was encouraged. There was advertising pro-smoking. So maybe there's a bit of that as well. I'm not sure. So let's keep moving. As technology makes labor more efficient, decreasing the cost and the, decreasing the, cost and the price of goods and services, we use a smaller fraction of incomes on traditional goods with a relatively inelastic demand, such as food, clothing, and so on. So those goods are considered as well as primary goods, like primary needs goods. Things you're going to care about before moving on to, you know, moving on to spending money on your hobbies and so on. First thing is going to be food, shelter, shelter, clothing. Once you have those things, then you're going to look at, oh, maybe I can get a communication device like a phone, or I'm going to get a laptop, or I'm going to spend some money in my hobbies, and so on and so forth. And so we tend to use a larger fraction of income on new products and in particular on services with relatively elastic demands. So in general, our income goes first into primary needs like food, cloth shelters, which are like goods. And eventually, as you get richer and richer, you don't need to spend proportionately more money in your uh, in your food or in your clothing. You can choose to, but eventually, you know, if you're a billionaire, you're not going to spend 80% of your money on food and clothing, as opposed to when you were a student, a grad student in particular. So as you get richer and richer, you tend to spend more of your money on services. You're going to get maybe um, subscriptions to Netflix, Crave, and whatever other things online. You are going to um, get a membership at a gym. You are going to um, invest some money in some of your hobbies, which are services. So if this is true, long-lasting unemployment due to technological changes is unlikely to occur because there will always be a demand effect for something else because our wants are unlimited. So there will be a shift from one sector to another. Think about agriculture. There used to be many people on the field. Then came the agricultural revolution with tools, with horses, with a wheel. And so that uh, decreased the need for, um, for manual laborers. Then eventually with the first industrial revolution the uh, mechanical revolution came um, a bunch of engines that they can be used by one person to increase productivity so that now you have only one farmer or two per acre of land um, during the day. Whereas before you would have each of them manually picking stuff. Now you have machines that are going to um, harvest those things for you. So less need for people in the agricultural sector, people went to manufacturing, um, clothing, shoes, and a bunch of other products. Eventually, with the mechanization and the automation of uh, the, manu uh, the manufacturing sector, there was a decrease in demand for semi-skilled workers and more an increased demand for skilled workers, engineers, who are going to reflect on the whole production process and maybe know how to operate the machines. And eventually there was a higher demand for people in the service sector uh, where things are not as easy to replace, uh, to automatize. Think about a hairdresser. We don't have any machine that is um, good enough um, yet to replace a full hairdresser. The hairdresser now has great tools to make his work easier. He has the, um, well, the machine, he has a bunch of different scissors and so on and so forth, but he cannot be substituted by a machine yet. Healthcare as well, nurses, care aides, and so on. Doctors are not replaced yet, although actually some of their decision-making might, might get replaced 
by machine learning algorithms in the future. That will actually be a, uh, an interesting time where doctors won't need to make as many decisions as before because machine learning algorithms might actually be more accurate at assessing, at giving a diagnosis. So that will be an interesting time for doctors which, have, which might have to uh, train themselves in statistics to understand exactly what, um, what the machines are doing. So, if you add um, this to low demand elasticity, could this break down leading uh, to technological unemployment? Well, this could happen if skills, organizations, institutions are unable to adjust fast enough to keep pace with technical changes. So the time it takes for one sector to reshift its labor force to another sector might be too long compared to the technological innovations that might be occurring in the meantime. So that in this new sector that where people were in demand, people might not be in demand anymore, it might be another sector. And those workers might not be able to change fields and train themselves in time to um, accommodate for, to, um, to absorb the new technological changes. So the technique issue leads to temporary unemployment as long as workers have time to adjust their skills. Entrepreneurs can invent new businesses. They can say, they can feel, they can smell the sunrise sector and say, oh, I need to open a business in this because right now or soon this business will boom. New firms get created to absorb newly developed skills and institutions are flexible enough to make all of that possible. This takes time, take time, typically decades. So very often there is a core of people who talk about this, who talk about what's going to be the next sunrise sector, but it takes a long time for the whole population to be aware of it and to have fully adopted the changes. Everybody still, everybody talks about machine learning today, but the first self-driving car, I believe, was made in 1989. There was something like that. Not that it was very performant, but there, was already, there were already machine learning algorithms back then. Eventually, those algorithms uh, found an implementation in more than 50% of the sectors, uh, in, in the, of all the sectors now. And so that everybody talks, everybody well, goes, to, goes to college, learns or hears about machine learning at some point. So, what if technological changes pile up so that new skills get obsolete soon after they are acquired? There's something I mentioned in the second unbundling, how, um, how developed nations should think about their education policies. They should not think about getting their population specialized only in one specific skill, but rather specialized in maybe two or three skills. So being specialized in a mix of skills so that they can find their niche and they might be able to adapt to a change in, um, in, um, in needs for labor. So if this happens, if technology changes too fast for institutions and people to keep up. Nothing prevents an economy to have fewer jobs than the number of people wanting to work. And then there could be a permanently high level of technological unemployment. Humans could become permanently unemployed when workers and firms do not have enough time to adjust. So that sounds like a very bad, um, bad scenario, but can you imagine this? Can you imagine this to be likely to happen? Technological changes are um, appearing at an increasing speed. That's true. Every year now, there is a new, not a groundbreaking innovation necessarily, but there are a lot of innovations which are built upon the previous ones. However, who makes those innovations? You know, 
if a firm does not have time to adapt, then uh, yes, then there will be a problem of unemployment. But if there is no demand, if there is an employment, there will be a lower demand for a lot of products overall. So there will be a lower incentive for firms to adopt those innovations. So I don't see um, that happening. I believe, well, I believe, or I could see one thing happening. Ha one thing happen. It's technological uh, changes happen at a very fast pace. And eventually, if people and firms cannot keep up, then the innovations will slow down again. Slow down for people to take the time to train themselves and for institutions and governments to um, adopt the um, appropriate education policy, social policies, and so on. And you're right, um, there is a lag in adoption that suppresses the negative feedback. Turns out, though, that the lag in adoption is shorter and shorter. Because what people work on nowadays, they would already do it before, is once they have found an innovation, it could be fundamental research, like pure innovation, like the laser technology, they have to figure out how to implement it. But more and more, those two types of research, fundamental and applied research, are going hand in hand together so that people can come up with a fundamental innovation, which is brand new, and at the same time already come up with products with, uh, with ways to implement that new technology. But yeah, if an employment is high, demand for goods might be low. And if an employment is doomed to be high, then should we consider a universal basic income system? I talked about this, um, I think, in the future of globalization. So I think one week or two weeks ago, um, where there has been this debate about do we pay, do we give, do we pay people money even though they don't work? Because chances are that some people will never be able to find a um, job in their field if they don't have the corresponding education. And as many jobs are being replaced by automation, but population is not decreasing, then there will be definitely a difference between labor demand and labor supply. So that maybe we should consider paying people a fixed amount of money every month and they don't need to work. The ones who want to work could be paid maybe this universal basic income as well and have an extra labor income. I, for example, would always want to work one way or another. It's not that I need to work, I'm a workaholic or anything like that. It's just that I like to be busy. So work is a way for me to get busy. But if it's something I don't like, I would prefer being busy with my hobbies and getting maybe the universal basic income. And this is the idea of freeing people from work. People who still work in factories do eight hours a day in the factory, don't see the light. It's because, yeah, don't see, don't see any light sometimes. They have a 30 minute break to eat quickly. They are constantly standing and moving. That's grueling work. When you are in your 20s, it might be fine, although you might not even be used to it. But when you're in your 50s and you have 15 years to go, that's pretty hard because the pace is not going to go slower just because you're older. You still have to, f to meet your uh, daily production. And so whether you're 60 years old or 25 years old, you're going to have to keep up with the pace. A question in the chat. Why would governments care about universal basic income by the point where they won't rely anymore on large swaths of their population for um, GDP? So, well, growth might be out of the picture in the future, but there needs to be some, um, there needs to be some consumption and there needs to be a basic amount of needs to be met. So I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, but the idea of the universal healthcare system, the universal basic income, would be to fund it by stop funding the healthcare system. So one way to fund it would be you pay a fixed um, wage to people every month, 
but you're going to decrease um, universal health care. So you're going to let people be responsible for their own health expenses. That will be one way to, um, to fund this system. And there are many, there are many holes right now. The, 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 the question of is it fundable, is it sustainable, is pretty, it's pretty important. It's not clear if um, this system can be fully funded by the government. Well, if their job potential is obsolete, um, the government would maybe just pay them a fixed amount of money and they could do whatever, but they would be responsible for um, their own expenses. Taxing the rich, yeah, that could be a way. But at the same time, the problem is if you tax the rich, the capital, remember, financial capital is not sticky at all. It has high international mobility. So if rich people are being taxed, they are going to move their funds somewhere else where they're going to declare the income somewhere else where taxes are lower. So the problem is competition. If you compete with other countries that have a lower uh, income tax or corporate income tax um, or um, wealth tax, property tax and so on, people might just try to decide to move their funds to another country. That's a huge problem in Europe as well. Europe is under the same currency, but each country has its own tax system. So if a company wants uh, to benefit from a more lenient tax system, they can move from France to Belgium, for instance, or from France to Switzerland. In fact, there are some athletes, I know a tennis player, the best French tennis player right now, um, has his income, so if he plays for France, if there is like a, Olympics and so on, but his income is declared in Switzerland. How convenient. So I want to finish this uh, lecture. So I won't go for the break today because I have three more slides. Uh, yeah, so that's Gail Morphis. The other one I was thinking of was uh, Joe Wilfried Tsonga. That's the other French player. I think that's the one who is... Uh, Located in Switzerland right now. Gasquet is out of the picture now. He's not, I think he's too old now. He might be coaching, but he's not definitely not playing anymore. So there was this study uh, released by Statistics Canada. You can check the website at the bottom. Um, it's a study about the automation of jobs in Canada. So based on numbers from 2016, based on surveys, um, this report tries to estimate the types of jobs which are going to be at risk due to automation. So this graph, for instance, shows the estimated share of workers facing a high risk of job transformation due to automation by highest level of completed education. So they look at pretty much the way the survey was, the, the report was done was they look at the type of jobs uh, that require these kinds of degrees and they look at the evolution of those jobs over time and they look at how likely those jobs are uh, to be automated in the future. So they concluded that people with a master's degree had a pretty much, what, 2% chance, 2% risk um, of being replaced by machine. So 2% of people with a master's degree face a high risk of job transformation due to automation. Note that it says transformation. It doesn't even say replacement. It could be that the, the nature of their job will change due to, the, um, due to automation, but it might, they might still keep their job. And you can see that the ones with no certificate, diploma or degree at the bottom and high school diploma or equivalent are the ones facing the highest risk of transfer job transformation due to automation. So the most, uh, the more um, educated you are in terms of degrees, in terms of uh, yeah, um, st straightforward university degrees, pretty much the less, the less likely your, um, the less likely the risk of your job being changed due to automation. 
The idea is that as you get higher and higher in education level, the type of positions that you will have to, um, to take or that you want to take will be decision positions. They will be non-routine cognitive positions. So positions where you need to think and positions which are non-routine. So they cannot be automated by an algorithm. Teaching, for instance, is exactly that. It's non-manual, it's cognitive, and it's non-routine. It's routine in the sense that, yes, I'm teaching here every week with you guys, but it's not routine in the sense that a computer cannot, right now, log in every uh, Thursday at 10.30, make you do the quiz, and then go on with the lecture. I need to be there. I'm relatively safe, and you guys are relatively safe as well. If you look at bachelor's degree, in general, well, you're the second lowest risk of uh, job transformation. That's not in economics, that's in general. But um, in general, a bachelor degree will give you enough skills to um, take positions where you have to make your own decisions, where you don't need to just press a button and the computer is, doing, is going to run everything for you. Bachelor degree is considered skilled work. So computers are going to be a complement to your work. You will use what you learn, data science, uh, any theory uh, in, in any of your um, field of study. You're going to use those things to make decisions, but the machines are not going to do the job for you. You might still need to go through the machine, uh, go through a computer to use tools like, you know, spreadsheets, statistical software, PowerPoints, and so on. But that will help you in your job. Okay? Exactly. Medium inputs increase the productivity of skilled workers. Bachelors are considered skilled workers. In general, of course. Next is the estimated share of workers facing a high risk of job transformation due to automation by age group. So this shows that the, um, the ones age 55 and over are facing the highest risk of job transformation. And the risk is around, what, 14%? Something like that. So there's a 14% chance that their job will be transformed due to automation if they are 55 or over. The second highest is actually people between 18 and 24. But between 18 and 24, it's mostly due to the fact that people taking those jobs are usually young people who might, well, yeah, 18, 24 is young. <laughs> what I mean is they are taking um, rather low skill jobs, either because they're studying or because they uh, started working after they finished high school. So in general, those jobs will be rather low skill jobs. The ones which are 55 are the ones who were trained a long time ago and that, um, which, which jobs might be replaced in the future, but not yet because firms are waiting for those workers to retire. It is true that with the fourth industrial revolution and with the advent of machine learning algorithms, there's going to be a time where you won't be even needed to make a decision. The um, algorithm is going to take all the inputs, make a decision for you, and your job will just be to convince the audience of this result. So if you work in a business, you might use all the algorithms in the world, and they will tell you to increase advertising in, uh, in this area. So increase YouTube advertising, for instance. Your job will be to explain why that is to people who don't know those algorithms or to people yeah to people who don't know the foundations behind those those algorithms the same way as doctors who make diagnosis about um oh i think you have breast cancer and so on a lot of those diagnostics diagnosis are based on um just based on observations based on symptoms so a doctor is going to observe um, coughing, tiredness, 
fever, and so on. And he's going to look in his book. He has a huge book. They have Bibles where they're going to look for certain types of certain number of symptoms. And they're going to say, oh, it's likely that there could be this disease. And in fact, then they can relate this disease to the type of person, to the person's background, maybe to the person's genes or person's upbringing, and so on. Well, there's going to be a time at some point where the doctor will put, will put all of those diagnoses, all the, sorry, will input these symptoms and the machine, al machine learning algorithm, based on all the data used previously, will be able to um, provide a rather accurate diagnosis. And it might be a time where the diagnosis will be more accurate than the doctor himself. And so the doctor will be put in the second, um, in the second plane. He won't be the one say, I decide what you have. Like I, it's like more, this is what the machine predicts and I agree or not. True. Why do we even need doctors to input symptoms? There might be a point where a patient will put his own symptoms on a machine and the machine will directly provide a diagnosis. It's true. Doctors won't be fully replaced. Okay, because machines can be wrong and there can be outlier diseases that machines are, might not be able to predict very well, but that doctors might be able to predict. Now let's look at the share of workers facing a high risk of job transformation due to automation. So, manufacturing first. That's, uh, that's not surprising, I hope for you, <laughs> for you guys, after this whole course. So it seems that a bit more than 25% of workers working in manufacturing face a high risk of job transformation due to automation. Transportation and warehousing is also pretty big. Um, I mentioned the example of working in a warehouse for Amazon where workers are at a stage where they cannot even speak to each other when they're next to each other because the voice recognition machine will uh, pretty much will bug, will have bugs. And you say, hey, I don't understand your command. Please state your command. And the guy has to say exactly the right number at the right thing. Um, the machine, I believe, could also sanction you if you, uh, if you swear. There are things like that which are pretty crazy. Less so in uh, less so in services that imply um, in-person interaction. So, information and cultural industries definitely culture. I don't know if computers are able to do uh, good art yet, and I don't even know what I mean by good art because I don't know shit about art, nor that I care. At least paintings. <laughs> um, public administration. Educational services, so those are jobs that require a lot of in-person interactions. Finance and insurance, those are, you know, personal advising. Real estate, rental, where you need to be in contact with someone that's going to find the best place for you and negotiate the, um, the rates and so on. Interestingly, there's a pretty high uh, risk pretty high share of workers at risk for healthcare and social assistance. I did not expect this to be in the middle of uh, the graph. So I would have to look into the report to see what kind of jobs are at risk inside that, um, that industry. Um, wholesale and retail trade. There are already places where there are um, barely any people working anymore. So, I believe it's in Germany. You can go to some Costco type stores where um, you do everything yourself, literally. And so even the manufacturing, like putting things in the warehouse, the warehousing part is uh, taken care of by machines and, and things like that. So there's a lot of, not a lot, but there are some places where um, you don't see any worker. The workers are pretty much working at night on supplying the shelves and so on. Um, and then people just drive in and do their own thing. And that could be the future. Oh yeah, right. Amazon has fully automated grocery stores in Seattle. True, I forgot about that, yeah, yeah.
So let's finish with a bit of a um, couple of uh, YouTube material. Will robots take our job? That's a five minutes video um, and the link is provided here. You should check what Hemen means on Google Translate. That's not English. Another video, uh, are robots hurting job growth? 13, 13 minutes, Aki. And yes, Aki is Spanish, good one. And more about the fourth industrial revolution and its potential impacts, EC, which is French, yes. I wanted to put some Mandarin out there, but my software did not allow me to input the characters. I wanted to put Jolie, but um, my software did not allow me to copy paste the characters in a nice way. Is it? Hemen is Turkish for let's go. Okay. Um, Hemen is um, Basque for here. So that's here in Basque. So if you want to tell your kids to come here, you tell Hemen, Hemen. There you go. Any other questions? So, well, that is the end of the course. Um, a couple of things before I um, a couple of things before I finish the lecture here. So this was the last lecture for the course content. I will still have office hours this afternoon and next week. The exam is on April twenty eighth, which is pretty much the last day of of, uh, of of exams. I'm really sorry about this. I do not choose those dates. That gives you a good 20 days of study, so a good uh, three weeks, okay? Um, it will be two hours. The schedule on GoSFU says three, but let's make it two. It's gonna be in the same format as the midterm exam, so some multiple choice, maybe some definition questions here and there, and one or two questions, maybe three, about the... Um, about the um, about some analysis, some analysis, or yeah, things like that. Some economic analysis, maybe looking at a graph and so on. It will cover the whole lecture, the whole course. Although there will be a bigger emphasis on things um, starting with the second and bundling, second bundling and after, there will be more material covered on that. What else? I will provide a study guide. Um, sometime either today or tomorrow. So I'll provide a PDF that pretty much says what to know about each lecture, what to know overall, okay, with what kinds of questions you should be able to answer. And I will provide a PDF with the key concepts, which are the, the, the definition concepts every time, um, that I covered every time. I will provide them lecture by lecture, and you will be able to find them on the uh, Play No Words application. So I suggest you to go there if you want to play with the definitions. Remember, those definitions should, know, should be known by heart. I might ask you to provide some of them, to provide me some examples or to provide me, to tell me why a certain concept is relevant to explain a certain phenomenon. And other than this, what can I say? Uh, that was a pleasure. It was very new for me, so you could see that it's not a. Um, it's not very polished yet. I had some issues with the quizzes. I had some issues with uh, the course content. It was pretty long. Um, that's also why I'm not covering another lecture next week. Although I have content for another lecture, but I think there is enough for the course. I suggest you to learn what you can from it. Is the last. It's going to be probably your last exam of the semester. So uh, don't neglect it. There is useful knowledge in general, especially about how to handle your career, your academic career. We talked a lot about how work is going to change in the future, what types of skills will be in demand, um, or at least not a skill per se, but how to learn is going to be, is already in demand, is going to be in higher demand. Um, I hope I managed to open kind of your view on globalization, on economics in general. Some of you might take other courses with me 
um, in the future. I'll teach mostly 200 and 300 level econ courses. If you need any help with anything else econ related, but for a class that you're taking and that I'm not teaching, you can also ask and reach me by email. I always answer, no problem. Um, <clears throat> yes, one more thing. I assume that you already received the link to the um, to the final uh, to the um, course evaluation, the SETC uh, platform. Please submit a uh, submit some feedback, whether it's good or bad. Good feedback helps me for my career. Bad feedback helps me for my career. But if it's good, try to tell me, try to say how it's good. Is it the lecture mostly? Is it the instructor? Is it the content? Is it the delivery method? And so on. And if it's bad feedback, same thing. Don't just say the, um, the instructor is not lenient enough because this doesn't help anybody. Doesn't help me, doesn't help my department. The leniency is all relative. But you can say something that like the instructor is not consistent because maybe I wasn't. The, inst the instructor um, is not clear or goes too fast or not fast enough or is like his content, his content is too, comp too wordy, too long, I don't know, anything like that. But please provide some sort of feedback. That'll help us a lot. That'll be it for today. Have a good rest of your week and of your um, few weeks. I'll see you for the final exam. I will put the link on Zoom, same thing. So uh, the, the link to the final will be uh, provided on the Zoom section on Canvas. And um, see you in the next one. Bye.